pursuant to the provisions of section 2.68.030 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws, notice is hereby given that if you're not satisfied with the decision made by the Metropolitan Transportation Licensing Commission, you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of certiorari with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the entry of the Metropolitan Transportation Licensing Commission's decision. We advise that you seek your own independent legal advice to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met. Mr. Fields circulated the uh, minutes from last month to the commission. Uh, have the commissioners had an opportunity to review those minutes? Is there a motion regarding approval? Move approval. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Uh, first substantive item on our agenda today is under wrecker and towing services. Uh, we've been asked to review a non-consent towing license for complete auto care. Mr. Fields? Uh, in uh, all of the wrecker permits uh, and company licenses expire in uh, at the end of November. Uh, complete Auto Care missed the deadline, and when they came to renew, we could, it basically we could renew their general record license, but we could not renew their non-consent license. We've not had any problems with them other than they failed to renew on time. No and I believe they're present. No complaints. No complaints. Would any of the commissioners like to hear from Complete Auto Care? Is there a motion regarding uh, whether to approve the I would, request? I would uh, approve, uh, move to approve uh, Complete Auto Care's application. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Any nays? Motion passes. Next, we have some driver applications uh, for under wrecker and towing services. Uh, Mr. Fields. Uh, Justin Brooks. Justin Brooks. Mr. Brooks applied to be a wrecker driver. His application originally appeared on the January agenda. Uh, he has failed to, uh, he failed to appear in January. You deferred action until February. And <coughs> he's not present. Move to deny. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Any nays? Motion passes. Uh, next is a driver driver application for Clinton Wayne Ellis. Mr. Ellis. Mr. Ellis applied to be a record driver. He was originally scheduled for the January meeting. He failed to appear. You deferred action until today. Move to deny. Uh, and there was a second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Um, nay. Motion passes. Next is a driver application for John Hobbs. Mr. Hobbs. John Hobbs. Mr. Hobbs applied to be a record driver. His application was originally considered in January. He failed to appear. You deferred action until today. Move to deny. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, motion passes. <coughs> Last is a driver application for Mark Karn. Mark Karn. Mr. Karn is a new applicant <laughs> and was not on the January agenda, but was scheduled to be here today. He had a couple of uh, issues he failed to disclose. The deferral to the March meeting. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Motion passes. Next, we've got. Um, a driver application for Stephen Stewart uh, as a under uh, excuse me under other passenger vehicles for hire. Mr. Stewart, come on, please. Uh, in making his application, Mr. Stewart failed to list a 1979 charge. Otherwise, he was qualified. Mr. Car uh, Mr. Uh, Stewart, what was the charge? Of oh, marijuana possession. It was dismissed. I don't have any memory of it. <laughs> I don't think 
make you make motion. <laughs> 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 Any commissioner would like to make a motion? Make a motion to approve Mr. Stewart's application. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we also have a re request by Reliable Black Car Service to add Azib Joaquin as a partner. Uh, it's uh, application, everything is in order. In order for to change the application, he, he has to be approved by the commission. Move approval. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Um, next on our agenda, uh, we've marked uh, down a presentation of the slow moving vehicle study that was um, provided to us last month by KCI Technologies. Mr. Fields, are they here to they make a present presentation? They are to make their presentation, Mr. Murphy. <coughs> Now, today is not a public hearing, so it's, it's a presentation for you to be able to hear what you want to hear, talk about what you want to talk about, but then any action would have to come. Additional meeting will have to be next month. Robert Murphy. Thank you. I'm Bob Murphy uh, with KCI Technologies, previously RPM Transportation. Uh, and I'm going to uh, go through some of the uh, results of our, tra or our study for slow-moving vehicles. I will be referring to... Uh, the uh, slides that are going to be on the screen, so uh, you might want to uh, look at those. Uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to read the study. If you have, have not, I would encourage you to read it. There's a lot of information in it. Uh, I'm going to try to hit the highlights today. And uh, first of all, the purpose of this study was to better understand safety and traffic operational issues related to slow moving vehicles in Nashville. And uh, as background, in 2016, uh, we completed a study of slow-moving vehicles. And that study primarily focused on slow-moving vehicles that traveled at speeds generally 15 miles per hour or lower. So this was for, Lisa, you want to advance the slide? For uh, uh, horse-drawn carriages, pedal taverns, and also pedicabs. The study did not include any detailed analysis of what is known as low-speed vehicles, such as a joyride uh, or what some people refer to as, as golf carts. Uh, so at that time, based on the study, the, the uh, licensing commission decided to establish restrictions for the operation of all slow-moving vehicles, uh, including the low-speed vehicles, so that they uh, do not operate uh, in the peak times of 7 to 9 in the morning and 4 to 6 in the, in the afternoon, Monday through Friday. Now, this current study looks in more detail and does a more thorough analysis, uh, analysis of slow-moving vehicles and looks in a lot of detail also at the low-speed vehicles in addition to, to the other slow-moving vehicles that we analyzed in the, in the previous study. And when we're talking about uh, slow-moving vehicles, uh, or the, or the low-speed vehicles, we're talking about vehicles that can travel 20 miles per hour, but travel under 25 miles per hour. I do want to note that there is a variety of other sightseeing and tour vehicles that operate in Nashville that are currently, currently unregulated by the TLC. This study did not specifically address these unlicensed vehicles. This chart currently, uh, this shows the current various types of slow-moving vehicles that are permitted to operate on Nashville streets. As, uh, as you can see, there's a total of 115 different permitted vehicles. There's 23 pedicabs, 19 pedal taverns, 56 low-speed vehicles, and 17 horse carriages. Now, a primary consideration of this study was, was safety. As documented in the previous study and also documented in this study, there's a significant, a significant differential in speed and also a big difference in size and weight between slow-moving vehicles and other motor vehicles that are on the streets of Nashville. And this includes the uh, low-speed vehicles. Now, research has shown that speed and mass differentials between two vehicles create a greater life likelihood in safety issues. 
simply put, the, the greater the speed and mass difference difference there is in between two vehicles that crash, the greater likelihood you're going to have for serious or fatal injury. Therefore, the more we can do to minimize mixing low-speed vehicles with higher speed and higher uh, weight vehicles, uh, the safer the conditions will be. So this study did look at, at horse-drawn carriages, uh, and our review of horse the horse carriage operations revealed several concerns, uh, most notably traffic conflicts between higher speed motor vehicles, conflicts between the carriages themselves, especially as they try to enter the uh, existing stand location uh, on Second Avenue, which can only accommodate about four carriages at any one time, and then also limitations uh, of downtown downtown streets just in terms of consistency with, with horse carriage operations. In evaluating the carriage routes and the stand, we identified three important criteria, and, and those are topography uh, of the street, the desire for visibility of the carriage and the carriage stand itself, and then the desire uh, for the carriages to, to want to pass popular destinations uh, and, and so we kept those, uh, that criteria in mind as we were looking at, at recommendations. This slide sh currently shows some of the limitations in where horses can travel. So uh, the area to the north uh, is, is hampered by steep topography. So, you know, that's an area that's, that would be difficult for horse carriages to operate. The area to the south uh, in Sobro has got a, a, a real mix of a lot of traffic and, and some streets that, uh, even though they're not signed for higher speeds, they actually operate for higher speeds. Similarly to the west, uh, you have that, that dynamic going on also, but also there's not much in terms of uh, popular destinations that a horse carriage would want to go to. So there are some limitations for various reasons on routes where the horse carriages uh, can go. This sh slide shows routes that are currently used by the horse carriages. Uh, Second Avenue, Broadway, and Third are desirable as routes from the standpoint of visibility, attractions, and topography. And the dotted lines uh, identify uh, some of the routes that are most popular for uh, the horse carriages that are used now. However, as I mentioned, there are some limitations with the existing stand, and that stand is on 2nd Avenue north of North Broadway. It experiences a number of, of traffic issues. First of all, it's adjacent to the busy intersection of 2nd of and Broadway, uh, and carriage traffic often backs up into Broadway as uh, they try to move into parking spaces, uh, and especially once, uh, once those parking spaces start becoming full. Uh, so there is limited parking space at that stand, and another aspect of that is, is that limitation also creates some competition between drivers trying to get to the parking space first and can create some conditions which uh, are really unsafe in terms of uh, interruption of, of traffic flow. To reduce these issues, we recommend that the stand be relocated either to the north side of Broadway, west of First Avenue, or to the east side of First Avenue, south of Broadway. These locations provide more queuing, uh, so there'd be less parking issues, and we feel like these locations would also impact traffic operations less while still maintaining high visibility for the carriage operators. Additional recommendations we have is uh, to continue to limit the number of carriages, uh, either per stand or on the street. Another option that could be used to enhance operations of the carriage, carriage at the carriage stands is to employ this use of staff that could be either Metro or Metro or uh, Downtown Partnership uh, em employees to kind of marshal the, the stand operation. They would help regulate the flow of carriages uh, into the stand uh, and uh, look at regular departure routes and or, or times, and then also 
could potentially oversee other uh, transportation licensing commission regulations. Another recommendation we have is uh, to make some revisions to the current routes and also consider additional routes. And uh, I'll, I'll talk about those routes in a minute. Uh, but first I wanted to, before getting to that, just wanted to also confirm that we are recommending that you maintain the existing permit levels uh, for the carriages. In terms of uh, revised routes for, for carriages, this slide shows some alternative routes that utilize streets north of Broadway, uh, but are designed to minimize the impact of, of uh, traffic flow. These are very similar to what's currently uh, utilized. We are not we are not showing, of course, Broadway and Third Avenue on on uh, these recommended revised routes. Additionally, we're proposing consideration of additional routes that could be utilized during the weekends or when carriage operations are not allowed due to special events. This could also, also be used uh, by carriages uh, that uh, are not able to operate because of limitations on the number of carriages that can operate at any one time. So the idea here is, and we've identified three potential locations, near the Bicentennial Mall, uh, in the TPAC Courthouse area, and then Stadium East River area. Are, so these would just be uh, locations with stands and routes that these carriages could use, uh, as I said, as alternatives to the regular routes. And typically they would be used, uh, our idea is they would be used when they can't be operated downtown because of special event closures, et cetera, uh, or uh, just to handle the overflow demand of, of carriages. So I want to move now to the low-speed vehicles. Once again, these are the, the golf cart type vehicles. Uh, first of all, as I know you're aware, their Metro has established a uh, low-speed service area. And this applies to all uh, <coughs> slow-moving vehicles. And you can see the area is, is rather large, extends out into East Nashville, as well as uh, west and south of, of downtown. Uh, currently, all slow-moving vehicles, or all low-speed vehicles can operate on all of these streets, uh, with the exception of any streets that are have a speed limit of greater than 35 miles per hour. And basically what that means is there's only a few streets that are, are prohibited routes, and those are shown here. The interstate <coughs> system, West End Avenue, se segments of, of West End segments of Broadway, as well as other segments of Charlotte, Church Street, 21st Avenue, KVB and Shelby, <coughs> James Robertson Parkway, and Rosa Parks Boulevard. So that, that means that there's really a, a very large number of streets where these vehicles can operate currently. I will point out once again that uh, according to the restrictions by the TLC, these vehicles are prohibited from operating between the uh, hours of seven to nine and four to six Monday through Friday. Now one of the things we wanted to do was kind of get, try to get a sense of, of how much traffic is out there in terms of slow moving vehicles. This may be hard to see, but uh, what we did is uh, selected traffic counts at several of the intersections in uh, downtown area of Nashville. And what we found is, first of all, the first uh, row uh, that shows the peak hour times up there, we did see that there are some uh, slow moving vehicles that are actually operating during the times that they're prohibited. Now, primarily what this is are these vehicles that, from what we could tell, trying to position themselves so that, say, when the restriction time ended, they were ready to go. Uh, so as you can see, like, for instance, during that uh, time period, there were 10 low-speed vehicles that we saw at the locations that we counted. Now, during non-peak times, which uh, were counts that were just done for two hours, uh, 3 to 4 p.m. and 6 to 7, uh, we, we, at these selected intersections, you can see the, the counts there. So. Pedicabs, there were two. Pedal carriages, there were nine. Horse carriages, there were three. Low-speed vehicles were 69. So uh, obviously the low-speed vehicles are the predominant uh, mode 
type in, in, uh, in this category. So when we're looking at maybe uh, modifications to routes for the low-speed vehicles, you know, we recognize that there's certain factors that we need to take into consideration. Obviously, destinations. Where would these people, where do people want to go that would utilize the low-speed vehicles? And we I will say we do also recognize that these low-speed vehicles do provide a, a, uh, an obvious transportation benefit. Uh, because they are providing transportation uh, that is pretty, pretty uh, easy and nimble to go to with, without, and, and in that way reducing the actual car traffic that's on the street. So there, there are benefits, obviously, to these, to these type vehicles. Uh, some other considerations uh, are posted speed limits, just primarily because of the restrictions uh, that they have on streets that they can operate, but also because to the greatest extent possible, we want these low speed vehicles to, to be on streets that are lower speed. Uh, the number of lanes, uh, as well as traffic volumes. Now, in some cases, it's fine for them to be on a, on a two lane road if the traffic volumes are low. In other cases, if the traffic volumes are, are moderately or high, obviously we would wanna have them on streets that have uh, you know four lanes in each direction or more so that cars could pass them if, if necessary. So in looking at, at uh, recommendations for the low speed vehicles, we came up with a number of, of suggestions. First of all, uh, as an option is to restrict uh, the operations to uh, potentially designated routes or at least to reduce some of the routes that are currently uh, being utilized. Uh, another option is simply to reaffirm the roadways that are currently prohibited. Our recommendation is that, that, that it would be desirable to, to do some additional restrictions. Uh, another potential option would be to, uh, to limit operations by prohibiting tours. So the, you know, the problem with tours is that uh, oftentimes the low speed vehicles will stop to talk about a particular spot or slow down. The other, uh, the other uh, recommendations are first to, to monitor and enforce current operations and one, uh, I guess one tool to help that would be to require GPS units on, on all the vehicles. Uh, then next also would be enforcement and education of current parking uh, restrictions and requirements. One of the things that we saw is that there's misunderstanding apparently between uh, what is a uh, what is a uh, loading zone and what is available for passenger curb loading. Loading. So if you have if you are unloading and loading passengers, uh, this is supposed to transpire within three minutes. If you're actually unloading freight, then those loading zones are allowed for 30 minutes. And we saw lots of times where the unloading or or waiting for passengers extended past the three minutes. Uh, one recommendation is potentially add excessive noise provision uh, to the requirements for low speed vehicles. This is similar to what is currently required for the pedal car carriages. And then to ensure that all low speed vehicles com comply with the federal equipment requirements. We saw some cases where that was not the case. These are not extensive re requirements. They require things like uh, uh, headlights, rear view mirrors, uh, seat belts, et cetera. Enforce alcohol restrictions for passengers. Uh, there were some cases where we saw that being, uh, being misused. And then finally, once again, maintain the existing permit levels at, at 56 vehicles. We included in the study some potential uh, route restrictions. And this, this is something that, uh, you know, could could be considered or even adjustments made to it. But we do, what we did look at was how can you potentially serve the major locations that, you're, that, that are desirable locations for these uh, utilization of these vehicles. And we found that that can be accomplished by limiting the, the routes much more than they are currently. Moving on to pedal car carriages, uh, you know, we, we dealt with that quite a bit in our previous study. And this study, uh, 
we're looking again uh, in terms of recommendations for restricting the routes uh, and uh, this would be similar to what I just discussed for the low speed vehicles there uh, you know we also feel like it would probably be reasonable to allow requests for additional areas uh, if specifically approved by the TLC for good reason uh, we do think it would be desirable to uh, require motor assist capabilities to these vehicles so that uh, the speed differentials are not as great. Once again, enforcement of the noise restrictions. There are, uh, there are regulations for that. They're just not being enforced. And then once again, maintaining the existing permit levels. This is a, a uh, uh, example of, of potential route uh, routes that could be identified for the pedal carriages this would be in the downtown area you still have good coverage downtown uh, but uh, we've looked at trying to restrict the use to some of the higher volume uh, streets uh, that are, are in the downtown area and then also the next slide shows uh, similarly uh, for midtown in the gulch how you, a route that could serve these two areas uh, without having as, as great of an impact on uh, regular traffic. In terms of pedicabs, uh, we felt like for the most part the regulations are in, in good, good shape for that. Uh, some suggestions are considered requiring motor assist capabilities for these vehicles and then also adding the similar noise restrictions that pedal carriages have as well as uh, the alcohol provisions that apply to the low sp speed vehicles and once again recommend uh, keeping the permit levels at 23. In closing this is just a summary of our recommendations and I've covered uh, each of these I think uh, but uh, the one point I would make which I've already said is is our overall recommendation is to maintain the, the current permit levels for each of the different vehicles. We feel like there traffic has increased obviously in downtown Nashville over the last several years it's still continuing to increase and based on development that's already underway or coming it's going to con con continue to increase even more so we feel like it's it, it would be wise to take a cautious approach on expanding any permit request so with that I'll close and uh, I'm available to answer any questions interview or talk to any of the companies we did not for this study we had we had talked with the uh, pedal carriages for the previous company I mean for the previous study but for this one no on the suggestion about moving the carriage stand for the horse-drawn carriages um, do you see potential hurdles at all in relocating the stand uh, to that First Avenue Broadway area that you were referring to. Well, I, I think I think there's there's challenges wherever you put it uh, because you know you're putting a, a use that requires a lot of space and also is low speed as they come in and out. Of, so there's there's no great solution to that that solves all problems. So yes, I do see some. Now, I think uh, in terms of availability of, of space I, th I think you know those are our two two best locations uh, I don't know if Billy you wanted to add anything about currently those spaces are one is a taxi cab stand and the other is a uh, uh, just a straight loading zone it has been uh, we have used it for temporary stands for carriages in fact we may be having to do that because of some construction that may or may not be happening on second avenue so I've already asked traffic and park is actually look at that right now but what Bob is referring to it if if it were to go at the foot of broadway they would actually come back around up first avenue uh if they weren't all in the stand so rather than crossing traffic they're going to be in basically in that inside lane uh next to the sidewalk all the way around yeah. do you know um how changing the regulations or you know how any of your recommendations will affect um, safety or the local economy and and by that I mean I feel like we have increased levels of tourism 
And so if we're keeping the permits the same, but we have more people coming to Nashville, that means, you know, in total, there's not as many people using, using these, um, these types of vehicles. And so as far as safety is concerned, um, how does that impact people that are coming to enjoy themselves and partake in adult beverages or 18? <laughs> um, and, and as far as local economy, um, you know, restricting the level, the number of permits, do you, did, did your study cover any of that? To the extent that we recognize that, as I mentioned, that you know these vehicles are providing a service, <coughs> low-speed low vehicle in terms of simp simply providing transportation, but you know the pedal carriages and the horse carriages also in terms of providing a service that people will want to come to Nashville for. So, you know, we wanted to be careful about not shutting that off. I think the and, and uh, the other side to it is we know that there is likely more demand than and going to be more demand uh, than maybe there are uh, vehicles to accommodate. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other side to it is really a balance of those, those amenities and those benefits versus traffic flow and safety. And for instance, low speed vehicles, they were initially uh, envisioned when federal regulations allow them to operate in low risk environments like you know in, in uh, communities that where people drove from you know house to pool or house to golf course or something or, or whatever and now they're operated in much much broader area and so, so I think it's important that we're careful about how we expand that utilization uh, because, you know, I mean, there's the low, the low speed vehicles, none of these vehicles, including low speed vehicles, are what we call crash worthy, for example. And, you know, as a result, any kind of crash that might occur could involve serious safety, you know, potentially uh, injuries and fatalities. So that's, that's really what what our recommendations are centered around and we recognize that there may be some impact to uh, future potential uh, utilization of, of more of these uh, of more of these services uh, but we wanted to I mean we're very conscious of, of not trying to hamper current operations and their economic conditions so you know that's that's you know hopefully what we've done and if not I think you know we're we're certainly available for discussions on on that. <clears throat> Ask a couple of questions. You mentioned the um, maintaining the existing permit levels. Is is that another way of saying don't ever increase it? You're not really saying that maintaining them is the right way to go. You're saying not to increase it. Because we're saying not to increase it. From my interpretation with all the conflicts that are out there even if you maintain the existing levels and you're still creating conflicts and traffic there speed are, and safety right, right. so there from are. a traffic engineering standpoint you would probably say that you should reduce them instead of maintain them I don't disagree with that okay. we, we, I think the maintain side goes more to the previous question as far as okay. You know, they, they have something that's it's not, I don't know if you would consider it a vested right, but they, they have a permit, so, yeah. you know, for a, certainly for a period. Uh, and the, the permits for, is it necessity and convenience? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's things that are unnecessary and inconvenient, like sometimes certain benefits and amenities could fall under that definition as well. My next question is, has anything uh, come to your attention in the past month or so when this report was given to us until your presentation today? Any new material that you would <coughs> add? I don't think so. Okay. I know Are you're you constantly aware? learning things. I am. Are, 
I can always try. Are, are you aware of anything you need to let me know about? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> okay. Some of the, one of the more interesting proposals that I would like to hear a little bit more on is your suggestion that we consider restricting particular vehicles to certain routes. And I'd like to hear a little bit more on how you went about selecting those particular routes. Um, obviously, we're going to be considering a number of things in the next few months, and, and uh, certainly that's one area that I think all of us would like to, you know, make sure we're making an informed decision about. Right. So that was really probably the hardest part of, of the study is, is trying to look at that. And we felt like that was important just because of what I've talked about in terms of the need to try to minimize the uh, mixing of either low speed vehicles and, and higher speed vehicles or uh, simply low weight vehicles and higher weight vehicles. And I mean, under the current situation, I mean, we can't restrict that <coughs> completely and we can't end up with a situation where you eliminate that, that issue. So what we looked at was where were routes to minimize it. And I, I'll give you an example. So the uh, Mumbrim Street is, is used a lot by the, the pedal taverns. So maybe ideally you'd want uh, them not to be on Demumbrium Street because it's such a heavy com commuting route. Uh, and, but because it's it, of where it's located and limitations of crossing the interstate system in the Gulch, Demumbrium Street is a street that we felt like they needed to continue to be on. Uh, so what we looked at were several factors. Uh, and where, what routes could we utilize that enabled, for instance, the low speed vehicles to travel to the locations where they needed to travel the most? And what were then the most desirable location or routes to get them from point A to point B? Uh, and then also looking at trying to give some flexibility uh, for them. Uh, and one of the recommendations we had is, is in the, that's in the study is, uh, as you know, streets are closed a lot in downtown Nashville co for construction. So if there's a route that's on the recommended route or the, you know, the route that's restricted that's closed, then they have the ability to go over a block to utilize that, that street. So we're trying to make sure that there's flexibility. I will say when it all comes down to it, you know, there's, there's a lot of judgment used in what's, what are the, one of the either best routes or acceptable routes. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's probably some discussion that is worth having for, from anybody who's interested in evaluating those routes in more detail. I have one more question. Um, I think that you said um, during the part of the presentation about horse-drawn carriages that the new um, station that you are proposing um, would use um, staff to, to, to implement and, I guess, enforce things. Did I understand that correctly? So we're, uh, I would break that into two separate recommendations. First recommendation is to move the stand, okay. regardless. The second recommendation is an additional consideration is to utilize staff to better manage <coughs> that. Okay. And so the question, thank you for clarifying that. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. The question behind that question is, are you recommending that additional staff be hired or would that be um, an expansion of the duties of just the current number of staff that, that uh, I guess, Metro has on board? Or feel, you mentioned the right. downtown partnership too, I believe. We feel that it would require additional staff. And I think that's one of the, one of, one of the aspects of that is, is an additional consideration of how you pay for that staff. And that, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, the most logical way to do something like that is through, uh, through permanent fees. That's done in other cities? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can't remember which ones, but we did a, one of the things in the study is a peer review of other, other cities. Mm -hmm. This is, I guess, more of a question for you, but as they were talking about the stands, we're 
the horse and carriage is? Where was their stand before its current location? It's current, it, it previously on Broadway. Before the uh, the loading zones were established on Broadway, uh, it was on Broadway. We moved Broadway. to second. Uh, we have actually had them on first in both of these locations, uh, and for temporary per temporary reasons, other times. <coughs> But it was moved to second because of the new loading that was just zones. The, that was the, okay. the uh, uh, desired location, but it is very limited from the size and with the traffic. Any other questions for Mr. Murphy? Would it, one other, if we did move the carriages from second to first, would that open up uh, Second Avenue then for a taxi <coughs> shared vehicle stand? As opposed to, uh, yeah, be because they'd be displaced from the other location. Yeah, that would open yeah, up more space, of a, curb space. Yeah, more of a traffic and parking question. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, <laughs> Mr. Fields. Uh, before we move on to the complaints on our agenda, is there anything else we need to do um, regarding? the presentation today um, there's no action that you need to take other than if you'd like to have a public hearing to consider any of these changes you'll just need to we'll just need to be able to announce and then advance if you if, if you want to do it in March we could if you said let's chew on it a little more we want to do it in April or, or whatever future date you don't have to take any action and if there's any additional information you require at that point then we could also you know seek that information out Well, we've certainly been presented with a num number of recommendations. Some of them seem relatively easy to implement, and others, you know, certainly would take a lot of hand wringing. Um, does the commission want to have uh, a public hearing uh, anytime soon on this matter? I mean, if we're going to have one in March, we probably should go ahead and make a decision quickly <laughs> to, so there's sufficient notice. Okay. Otherwise, we can push it. Given, given the number of uh, topics involved, would it make sense to break it up into parts? Mm -hmm. um, certainly do that. It could, do you have a recommendation on that? Well, if we were to do that, what we would do is we would call a special hearing, a special uh, or a public hearing that would uh, deal with the issues. You know, if I were going to put them together, you know, again, the horse and carriages is a very different issue because of the animals involved. You may want to do that separately just from the standpoint of there's more <coughs> movement and route. The, the other, you know, the pedal, car the pedal vehicles are all in the same ordinance. You could have three hearings on three different, the three different issues, uh, but I I'm, might pull the carriages out separate just so you can have a full hearing on carriage stands and how it works and routes and so the other things that uh, Mr. Murphy talked about. So an equine hearing and a human hearing? <laughs> you could call it that, sir, yes. <laughs> Do we need commission action to establish that? I think all you'd have to do is say you'd like to have one meeting one month and another meeting another month, and we'll we'll do that. that sounds like a good idea. Okay. <laughs> was there, You're the chair. Was there a preference on <laughs> what uh, we'd like to discuss? Commissioner, question. Sure. Do we do summer hiatus, or there's no we go straight throughout? We're the year. we're going to drive through as long as there's agenda <laughs> items. I'm going to ask you to come in okay. on Thursday <laughs> afternoon. Uh, unofficially, unofficially, sometimes there's not a December meeting. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just yeah. wanted to make sure that if we break it up, that you know we didn't hit up again. Some sort of. The only thing I would suggest, you know, peak season has not hit yet. Obviously, if you want to do one in March and one in April, that would be enough time for anybody to adjust anything. That, in most cases, if there's going to be anything drastic done, but um, again, it, it, I think the, the the biggest issues that'll be after will be the, the stand issue, and then probably any route issues that would come about. But there's there do not appear to be any prohibitions being recommended, other than limiting numbers. So I'm not sure it would affect operations that much. They might disagree with me, but I'm I'm not sure it would. And March is on a regular date, twenty second. Yes, March twenty second. And April's a regular date, the twenty sixth. Yes, sir.
All right, well, why don't we um, have a uh, meeting and a public hearing in March on the uh, pedicab, pedal carriages, and low speed vehicles? And then in April, we can schedule the horse carriages. We will have them on your agenda, sir. I think probably the, um, the one of the meteor issues that we might be finding ourselves dealing with is, you know, any consideration about route restrictions. Um, so I would. I would expect we'll hear a, a lot of, on that from the companies as well as members of the public. I'll, I'll try to have the appropriate police off uh, the police department representatives, traffic and parking representatives, uh, as well as I'll ask Mr. Murphy if he's available as well. All right. Can Thank you, Mr. Fields. Can we have those slides? Certainly. Okay. Sure. They become a part of the public record, so we can get that to you. Okay. Next item on our agenda, we've got uh, some complaints uh, that have been brought before us. Uh, the first is a complaint filed uh, by Mr. Amanji Abdi against A.B. Collier. Thank you. Thank you. You have the, the podium, sir. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. If you'll please just to officially reintroduce yourself since we're on live television. Yeah, sure. My name is Aman Jebda. You can proceed. Well, uh, Your Honor, my, uh, let me get my stuff. My truck was towed back in 12th of June. And actually, when I went to release my truck, I got some pro problem, which I mentioned in my letter to that, uh, to give it to the commission, to the director field. So if you want me to tell a quick story. Well, you don't have to go in. You can go into as much or as little detail as you'd like. Sure. We have presented your materials and we have reviewed them. Sure. But I didn't want to cut you short or make you feel like you didn't have an opportunity to sure. present your case. Well, first of all, you know, uh, they forced me, you know, to pay them by cash. And they, when I went over the first day, and I have everything on recording, I have my uh, laptop, so if you have the chance I can show you all those because I recorded with my phone and then I done, uh, downloaded on my computer so all we can see. Uh, I went over there after 24 hours and I tried to release my car, my truck and then they, they, uh, their credit card system was down. So they gave me a receipt, okay, but before that my first problem with them was the amount because I asked for breakdown, so why they charged me these uh, amounts, okay? Which is, I found a couple of them are against Tennessee codes, like that the first, if you guys have the first, uh, this invoice, which is, it has some writing in the top. Over there, you know, they charged me $115 for, uh, Rehook, which everybody knows who's this, this business, the big rig truck supposed to, supposed to towed from behind because the wheels is locked. And how they want to move with locked tire. So they have to hook it up from behind so they can move. So they charged me $115 for that. And when I told them that, you know, this is against law, or this is your problem. So then next day, they gave me another invoice for the same amount, but different different stuff. You know what I'm saying? And uh, also, when the, I was ordered after 24 hour, their credit card, oops, uh, 
Uh, I have all in my computer. I can show it to you guys, and I appreciate it if you give me the chance to show those video to the commission. Uh, they said that they n they're not gonna charge me for one more day for towing, which is here. It's signed by their employee, by Mr. DJ Michaels. Okay, and when the next day I went over there to release my truck, they said they're not gonna take credit card and they, it's only cash, and also I have to pay for that extra day. And when I mentioned, showed them this letter, they said this gentleman does not work here, which it is still recorded on those, my cam, my uh, uh, phone. <coughs> so basically, these people, they didn't, uh, they, no matter what, you just say, go over there, say hi, 500 something. If it's one day, two day, they make you an invoice for 500 something, which I have two different invoices from them. And also by Tennessee law, they have to provide me a credit card, which they said, we do not trust you. And even I offered them to hold my title, which again, I have to, did my laptop here with me and all those conversation is my laptop so if you guys give me the chance we can take a look to those conversation what's going on over there and I see also in your letter you mentioned that they charged you twice but then refunded you yeah the well that's one of the that's one of the issues you know they charged me first uh, that truck was only bobtail so they charged me for the bobtail and trailer. And on my uh, first complaints with the commission, you know, the commission uh, officer went over there and uh, st spoke with them. So they reimbursed me that extra charge. But the main thing is, on still, you know, on that charge, there is another problem. By Tennessee law, it says if any vehicle is more than 26 feet or 7 feet, it is 300 maximum charge for 350. Well, my truck is Fredliner, and Fredliner is 25 foot and 10 inch. Not by me, by the, com by the company that make those. If you go to the Fredliner website and tell them and ask for the Dimension size for that truck. That truck is 25 feet and 10 inch. That's not 27 foot. That's not 27 feet. So here they charge me for 27 feet. And uh, also uh, they charge me for the truck, but they are um, reimbursed in the end. So what type of relief are you wanting, Mr. Abbey? Well, as I mentioned in my, uh, I read the manual, okay, I read the manual and the manual says that I can ask for my full reimbursement, uh, which two days after I t released my truck, I went to the AB Collier and I spoke with this gentleman, white shirt gentleman, and I mentioned whatever is you know against that manual which unfortunately he used the bad word you know and uh, locked kicked me out of the business which again I have the video recording of that it's in, if you let me I can show it to you in a minute uh, so what I'm looking for uh, first of all they I found this business no matter what, you go inside, you have to pay whatever they want, not whatever is their charges, whatever is the state says. You know, they charge you, they make you an invoice, they do not gonna let you record anything, they will treat you with higher uh, invoice, they will treat you with trespassing, they will uh, hold your property and your clock is ticking. You know, they will hold, they will put a lien on your property. You have to release your property. Other than that, it will be higher bill. And I want to, you know, the, the commission make attention to those, you know, and stop them, you know, to doing that with other people. Because that's not 
the way they supposed to do. I think the manual is clear e uh, enough for everybody to see. If they want to do business, you know, they cannot use my property against me to put pressure on me like they did. Like first day, I have a video that I showed. I can show it to you guys. Can, can, should I go for the video now or later? Um. I don't. I don't need to see the video right now. So uh, they hold your property. You know what I'm saying, and they play with you. And every day, you know, it will go up. And then, uh, no matter what, uh, just somebody. If 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 I, if I really have the chance to ask them, why they gave me two set of invoice for same thing, and they are both same prices. They 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 math those numbers to bring up that number you know so no matter what they no matter what service they render to you they made their mind to how much charge you it's not based on what service they did it's based on how much they want to charge which invoice is was the original versus the read well read this one has which is has that uh, it says no charge no uh, for extra day that is the first invoice when I ask them to tell me uh, why, and also when I later mention them that th that one hundred fifteen dollar is wrong by Tennessee law, you cannot charge me. Even if you want, I can give you the uh, code number. Uh, Tennessee code six eight zero five five H one A double I. It says there is no. Charge, they, they're, not, they're not supposed to charge me. For, that's the Tennessee code, 680550H1AII. Okay, in my complaint uh, number five. Okay, so then they gave me the the bottom, the bottom one here. They gave me another uh, set of invoice, and no matter what, the amount was still the same. And so you want you, you want a refund of the charge? Yes, and also I want to commission take care. Of, uh, no, notice that that they're doing that. I, in my opinion, they're doing uh, towing. They are towing predator. Predator towing. They're looking to for somebody to somehow tow his car be towed, and then charging start. You know, they will be a Mr. Charger. Do the commissioners have any questions? Let's let's hear from uh, Mr. Could Brown. I ask a couple of questions to uh, sure. Tommy of Howland? If, if of course, you can ask some questions. I represent A.B. Collier. I have quite a while. Uh, Mr. Uh, is it? Uh, Amans or Apte? Pardon? Am Amans. My name is Amans. Amans. That's your yeah. first name, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, why was this car towed to begin with? Doesn't matter. Pardon? Why would that matter about the overcharge and the complaint? I'm sorry. I didn't know I was going to be restricted to my questions. No, I'm just curious you, why it matters. Well, it matters because of his attitude with regard to when he approached the folks at A.B. Collier. Uh, it's re pretty simple. This man. So well, attitude should matter in with the charge. You charge more for a bad attitude. No. Less for a good attitude. No, absolutely not. I'll agree with that. But you have to understand some of the things he's saying is colored by his what his attitude was when he got there. The, I, sorry if you think that's not. May I say something? Oh, just a second. You're going to be. Able, we're going to let him then testify as to what happened. If that's if that's what you want to do, if you don't want me to ask any questions, I understand. It's up to him. Well, uh, tell me. No, uh, I, you you can ask some questions. He doesn't have to answer them, but you can ask some questions. Why was it towed? The, that truck was parked in my exactly uh, lot beside my apartment. I had I had a heart attack. And the truck was parked over there for five months. So the property owner, he towed it.
but the truck was over there for five months and uh, I had the na which that lot is in the Napa Auto Store and I had the Napa, Napa Auto Store's manager permission which again I have my conversation with him recorded and it's in my laptop if you want to uh, it's towed because of it was the, the property manager wanted to tow it. Okay. Okay. That's why I was. Now, we'll let Mr. Dunn, this is Robert Dunn, we'll let him. Can I say something? Out. The last thing. Go ahead. You know, let's watch the videos. It shows how was my attitude. Well, I, I don't think your attitude is really relevant. I, I do well, if they, if they accusing so me to let's, that. Let's hear from Mr. Don. Sure. Let's see what's sure. exactly disputed. Oh. If we can come back with him. Let him get Go ahead. There's only one receipt. The first receipt presented when this gentleman came up there to check on his truck. Our dispatcher had called out for personal reasons and I had a driver answering the phone. Mr. DJ Michaels is on record as a driver. He wasn't a dispatcher. He was just trying to help us. And he did the best he could to get an estimate. This is an estimate. He, he did not pay that. He came back the next day and we presented him with the proper bill. All these charges have been checked in, in, by, the electric, uh, by the Transportation Commission and found that we did nothing wrong. The uh, part that we refunded him was on the storage part because in any other type of storage, like we tow in something from Metro or something, if a vehicle takes up two parking places, we're able to charge for two parking places. The parking places are $30 uh, a piece by Metro rules. Any of you have seen a tractor trailer, whether it's got a trailer behind it or not, it cannot fit into a parking place a car can fit into. It. So we charged him for the two places it took. We refunded him half that money to appease him. I'm not going to say anything about attitude, but when he came back, he demanded to see our books. He wanted to interview our drivers. He told us that he was going to own that place in a few days. When he went to pay, he told us straight out, I will pay you with a credit card, but I will challenge it. Now, that's like somebody standing there telling you they will pay you with a check, but it will be no good. We do over $1,000 a month in credit card. We've never had a problem before, but rejecting a credit card. But if a man stands there and tells you he's a credit card's not going to be any good, you would be a fool to take it when he's already irate. I can't tell you, I'm sure his film will show you us irate, but he will have omitted the first part of it where he came in demanding this, going in and out of offices, wanting to interview drivers. I, it was a nightmare. We called the police. It is a call is on, uh, I'm sure we can go back and find it. The police weren't quick to get there, and we did ask him to leave, and we did not touch him, but we tried to do everything we could to get him to leave. He was disrupting our business. So that's where we're getting into the attitude thing. I don't know if you call it attitude or what, but he was absolutely just harassing us to no end. Is there anything y'all need to ask him? What's the difference between a 26-foot truck and a 25-foot I'm glad you asked, sir. Mr. Fields wanted to, to measure that truck, and he has tried repeatedly to get him to measure the truck. And we agree with Mr. Fields. If it was wrong, we, refer, we would refund him the money. Is, am I right, Billy? We did ask to measure the vehicle and have been unable to do so. How many times have you asked him, Mr. Fields? Twice that I've asked for, for sure. And, and we actually set up one appointment. It was a late, it was an early morning appointment at 2 a.m., but he was not able to be there. Apparently. But he was the one who wanted to set up the 2 a.m. appointment. Correct. And he they agreed to even going out at 2 a.m. in the morning and, and measuring his truck. We agreed if the truck was indeed a different length, we reimburse him. He would, he refused to do that. So we didn't reimburse him. I mean, and Mr. Fields also had one of his uh, uh, inspectors come out and thoroughly investigate this. And you, I don't know if they have it or not. Do they have uh, switches before? They don't have our inspectors here if you'd like to speak. To did did uh, AB Collier measure the vehicle before they charged for being greater than 26 feet? No, sir. Uh, we went, uh, you know, most tractor trailers are that long. And like we said, if he had uh, presented a truck or let anybody measure it, it we wouldn't be here. But I, I feel like, and I could be wrong, but even being here is another form of harassment because we agreed to refund his money if he would have his truck re measured. What more can we do? Is there, is it, so is it just a coincidence that the two um, invoices are the exact same amount? 
They're not the exact same amount. There's uh, a six dollar difference, I believe. They're not the same. The young man that was acting as dispatcher that night, the driver that was trying to help, did the best he could. He the, was off some. The first one is 577.93. That was the estimate. The next one is 571.65, which is less. So it's not the same amount. I mean, it's not a made-up number. And you guys regulate us. We charge what you tell us we can charge. We're, we don't grab uh, figures out of the air. We've been there since 1929. This is the first time I've stood on this podium trying to defend something. He hadn't been there since 1929. No, no. I, I, <laughs> even though it appears I may have been, I, I wouldn't mind. I was close. <laughs> well, on the first invoice, it has a charge for towing and labor. The labor has been removed from the second Because there was invoice. no labor. Because, but, because there was no labor. Okay. But the driver so that, that was, night was just. an admin charge was added for the second invoice. Which we can do after so many present. days, yes, ma'am. Okay. And why are the towing charges different? Towing is appears to be 350 and one 315. Yes, because as as I said that night when the, the driver was in a three a tractor trailer under metro rates is 350. A tractor trailer I'm saying trailer a tractor under private impound is 315. He made that mistake. He was not charged that. He, he was, was charged a second. He was charged a second one, which is impound. There's different rate between a metro tow it in and a private impound. And a private impound is how much? 315 on a, on a tractor. So was it, because your second invoice says 315. 315. 315. No, your second one says yes, 350. No, the second one says. The second one says 350. Yeah, excuse me. I guess I'm backward. I don't have the rates in front of me, but uh, this was all investigated. and. Well, the, the second but, one says 350, and it's the one that has the three days on it. So I'm assuming it was prepared it was after the one that has two days on it. And so the second one has 350. 350. Uh, 350. All, all, all this has been investigated, and if, if I could, I'd like to call the, the uh, inspector that did investigate it. And he has his notes. I don't have my notes. So, you know, I got that switched. I'm sorry. Is it okay if, if Butch came up? Does the commissioner... Commissioners want to hear additional testimony? So there was, and as far as the number of days that were charged to Mr. Abdi, it, it ended up being just the two days? We refunded him 90-something uh, dollars. And as I said, and Billy will tell you, I offered to give it all back had he found us to, we should do it. They investigated it. Is that correct, Mr. Fee? That is correct. We had, uh, again, our goal, we don't have sides in these issues. We just want to make sure that the ordinance is followed. And, and uh, we, the simplest way for me to do was to measure the vehicle. It was not clear in my mind if you were to go on a website, yes, you can do that. By the same token, when I also go further, if the vehicle is modified at all, if you're measuring from tip, from bumper to the very end, it can be modified and actually be longer. Or at least that's what the experts in the field have told me. And I would submit uh, the report to Mr. Fields from Mr. Butch Morris, H.H. H. Morris, who is an inspector. I'd, I'd ask that that be submitted. I don't think that's in the y'all's file. What's the, so we we what? normally would let him present that to you at the meeting if you had questions for the inspector. And he's here. He's and he's here. He did a thorough inspection and told us we, did, we hadn't done anything That's why we've said it, we reset it for today so that he could be here. He was on vacation last time. Let's hear from our inspector. Mr. Morris. Do you have your report? Hello, Mr. Morris. How are you today, sir? Good. Good. Um, once I received the complaint uh, from Director Fields, uh, I contacted both individuals uh, about what the problem was. Um, I set up when I talked to Mr. Uh, Abda. Abda. When I talked to Mr. Abda the first time, I uh, told him that I needed to look at the truck to be able to measure the truck. Uh, he advised me that the truck was out of state, and I said that was no problem. We'd do it in three weeks, and the truck was to be in in three weeks, and I'd be measuring the truck. My intention was to take a plumb bob 
and go to the very front of the truck and drop it down, go to the rear of the truck and drop it down, mark it off, chalk it off, and measure it. Uh, he never did bring it in. He talked to Director Fields uh, and told Director Fields that it would be in on a weekend, and we agreed to go out at 2 a.m. in the morning and to measure the truck. Uh, again, uh, the truck was not made available to us to measure. I also went down to Freightliner, uh, Freightliner with the VIN number uh, that was furnished to me. Uh, the paperwork on the VIN from the factory states that it is 25 10, I believe, and uh, for the wheelbase. The rail length on the truck is 26.9. Now, the rail length is the actual, what the cab sits on. So again, that's, I talked to him again, again to set up a time to try and measure the truck. Again, using the plumb bump because the front of that truck extends beyond the rail length. Now the, the back of the rail length, excuse me, back of the rail length may not. It may be right at the point. Again, the truck has never been made available to us to measure. Uh, I, I told the director we were administratively closing the case because there was nothing else that we could do. Um, and I advised uh, uh, both subjects of the, of the problem. Now I will say this about the storage. Originally I had thought the storage was $60. He was very kind to, to point out a couple of things for me. Went back and looked at it. Industry-wide, the entire industry was charging $60. So we talked to Director Fields, Director Fields talked to you all, and that has been resolved. Now, I understand that part of that money was, was refunded, uh, uh, again, which is really not my concern other than to be able to furnish that up. Was it a 315 or a, a 315 or a 350 charge? 315 uh, or 350. We see it on both both of those. The second one that was done was 350. Which charge is actually a, would actually apply? Oops. The. This is the second one. Okay. Uh, the the 350, I think was a, was that charge. It was the correct charge. Yes, ma'am. 350. All right. And thanks for bringing up Plum Bob in the meeting. <laughs> that's I, what, I appreciate it. <laughs> that's, that's the only way I could figure out to get a true measurement on the truck, on the actual yep. length of the truck versus the uh, wheelbase and the, and the rail length and the actual yep. length of it. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions, any more questions? For I think that answers most of them, in a way. I just want to make sure I'm understanding this correctly. So. The ninety dollar refund, so it'd be five seventy one sixty five minus ninety dollars that yep, you've refunded. Yes, As a matter of fact, I have a copy of the check. Mm -hmm. Right. It took us. Uh, how long did it take us to get the check for him to pick it up? It was several weeks. Several weeks. We sent the check. We sent it certified, so we would have proof we did it. And we do have proof of that, uh, and it has been cashed. And that was because of the difference in that uh, Mr. Fields discovered. Which, if it were today, it would be sixty dollars. Yeah, they've changed. They've changed the rules since then. It would be sixty dollars now. Because it, it, it actually was, does take up two parts. Actually, y'all had in a public hearing last summer. Y'all had already you had recommended increasing. It was not increased until January. Thank you very much, Mr. Abdi. Yes, sir. Um, can I? Based, can yes, I you can certainly have a chance to rebut. Okay. First, uh, I got a question. Uh, so you said that Mr. DJ Michael is not dispatcher? Not a dispatcher. And, and okay. Uh, even the, the record. Uh, but I have the video I, that I gave him my no, credit no, card I'm to not, charge. I'm not, I'm not denying that he was there filling in for a dispatcher. I'm just saying that the okay. dispatcher so wasn't there and he did the best he could. I, when I came to go to the business, you know, uh, I don't inspect, I don't ask, ask for proper document that I'm speaking with the right person. Whoever represent me, I'm assuming he is the other side. But about that tractor, let me ask you this. Uh, well, 
let me ask you this. First, are you guys charge by Tennessee table or you guys charge by your measurement, like this truck take two parking place, this truck take three parking place? Or do we, let's first define our term. Do we go by Tennessee tables or do we go by, excuse me? I'm just. Do we go by the Tennessee table or Tennessee? I'm sorry, I don't understand what the Tennessee table is. Well, in the manual of the transportation, there is table 68550B1. We're, we're governed by the transportation I, I, I think there's a, let me make sure, he's refer, I think what he's referring to is the Metropolitan Code of Law, which is 6.80 governs tax. The TCA, this isn't a TCA code, it's a, it's a metro code. Yeah, but this is for, that's exactly the manual and, and that you gave it to me. To, that's the one he has to follow. You, I'm just, you're misstating it. I mean, you've got the right table, but it's the Metro Code of Law rather than the Tennessee Code annotated. It's just a phraseology. That, that is the, what they But have they to have follow. to charge me they based on this. They have to charge what the commission, what the Metro what, Council has but, approved. But based this one, right? So here it's under uh, section C under line D. It I'm exactly sure. says tractor. Right. $35. Mr. Abdi, it doesn't appear that there's a dispute on what was charged um, or that the amount charged, assuming that the length of your truck is over 26 feet, is correct. Excuse me? It, d it does not appear that you can um, dispute that the amount charged you was incorrect, except for the possibility that your truck may be under 26 feet. Well, as I mentioned earlier, well, the, okay, the truck is it's a big rig, it's on the road, okay, and I told Mr. Fields that probably truck it will be here on the weekend, Saturday night at 2 a.m. But the driver got stuck in Arkansas in traffic, and he had to shut it down in Memphis. He couldn't get here. You know what I'm saying? And that truck didn't came to Nashville. It go through Nashville to North Carolina. And every time that truck pass Nashville, it will be between 12 to 4. It depends how traffic, when the loaders get ready, how is the traffic, how is the rain, how is the snow. Mr. Mr. Okay. Fields, what's the charge if the truck is under 26 feet? Uh, for the storage would be $30 if it were if, versus a $60 charge. Which we've already refunded. And the towing fee would be less. The, well, the towing fee, it's, it's still, the, the truck would still be covered by the safety. Because it's, it's a rig. Because yeah. of the poundage. Yeah. So it's a C record. And it requires a C class, which is the, the larger of the records we regulate. Yeah. Can I answer that question? Here's based on the, this table, it says if it's under 26, it is $2,200. Pardon? Based on this table, it says if it's less than two, 26 feet, it is two hundred dollars. Yes, sir. And also, the, the first day, I would appreciate it really if you at least have two minutes to watch that video. That you know they told me that because of their credit card is down, they are not gonna charge me. This Mr. Michael. Right, they, but they've already refunded you for that additional. No, day. sir. They did. They that haven't. The they haven't. Correct? That. They charged me three days, which they're supposed to charge me two days. They charged me three times 60, then they charged me, they refund me three times 30, but still one day extra. There is still one day extra. Here is the- $30. Excuse me? You're looking to be refunded $30? That's $30, yeah, uh-huh. And also about that and basically, what I'm trying to do. They mentioned this is $6 different, but in $570 bill, it's, I don't think $6 is a different. If we don't talk, we do not talk about $10, that which is $6 is a big different. We talk about $571. In both sides, they gave me a receipt for $500. 70 and up. One is 577.93 and one is 571.65. All right, well, Mr. Abdi, I, I think we've heard 
everything. So let sure. us deliberate and then make a decision. Sure, sir. Thank Definitely. You. Thank you, sir. Um, it, it appears, Mr. Fields, that the ninety dollars was a refund to Mr. Abdi, it, it assuming was, the vehicle was under twenty six feet. They, is that they, correct? They, that, that's my. That's what they wanted to do to try to resolve the issue. And then the issue of being charged for the third day, if it is under 26 feet, then it would be $30 additional correct. amount that should be refunded if it, he's only be charged for two yeah, days. It, and, and again, that's where it really came down. All of the violations, when everything boiled down, what came to for me in our office was determining how long the truck was. And we were unable to do that, so we actually closed the case and said, we can't measure it, so we're, we can't proceed. And then he asked to appear in front of the commission, and we, uh, again, it's not our side or the other, gave him that opportunity, which is today. And I still can't tell you for sure, and, I'm, and again, I just, I can't tell you how long the truck is. I don't know. And we would submit that it is over that amount, and so you can't make any, you, it's over 25 feet, so you can't really make any refund, although we have done that in effect to assuage this gentleman. And uh, Well, the, the problem is, is Mr. Dunn concedes that, they, that his company didn't actually measure the truck, so we don't have any kind of objective evidence of what the length of the truck is right now. Um, be a tractor to haul a trailer like it does, it, that is their experience that that's what the length is. It's over the 25 feet. And you heard everybody pretty well says that that's probably what it is. This is just the way that they have figured it. In order for a truck that size to haul different, you know, you'll see a truck one day and have a different type of trailer on it and everything. The truck has to be so long for that fifth wheel to move back and forth for different size trailers. You, you'd sit your fifth wheel in a place on one trailer that was light in a completely different place than you sit on a much heavier trailer or a tanker truck. So the trucks are made pretty universal because you don't have a certain kind of truck to haul a certain kind of trailer. Tractors are universal. If they go to pick up a milk truck or if they go to pick up a cargo truck or something, so the length is pretty much universal. So we've never measured one. A tractor is a tractor, and it's, you know, it takes up two parking places. Mm -hmm. We have our own tractors. I mean, it's just, it's just something that's the way it is. And now it is different. Now it is $60. Right. It's, it, it, you changed it. Right. I understand. And, and that was the understanding. <coughs> You're saying, Billy, that 60 didn't go into effect until January. We, you, you actually debated that last July, I think, is when that, that issue was being dealt with, prior to this complaint coming to the commission. Any other questions uh, for either Mr. Abdi or Mr. Dunn? So we're looking at $30. Correct. Excuse me, what about that 150? Because uh, the truck, as the inspector Morris mentioned, is 25 foot and 10 inch bumper to bumper based on Fred, li Fred Liner. Well, it's still two inch less than 26 feet. Mr. Fields. That, again, has been an issue all along. When we investigated, we know that, as the inspection, the rail is which you know that I'm the expert on these particular issues. The, the cab sits on the rails. The rails, according to their specs, are 2510. But what I'm also advised is as that vehicle is, uh, is completed with cabs and so forth, bumpers and uh, all the other accoutrements that go with the vehicle, that it's going to be longer than that. But so, which is why I asked to measure it, because that is the simplest way. I'm not that bright, but we knew we could measure it if we could touch it, and we were, we've been unable to touch it. I have a question for Ms. Hatt. Are yes. there is there a bumper on the front of the truck? Yes or no? Uh, yes or no. Uh, original, yes, original. Is there a bumper on the back of the truck? No, not the back of the truck. There really? is no. Yes, sir. It's a big rig, and you know what I'm saying? If you call it bumper, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? And thank you for mentioning me to, harassing me to answer yes or no. Pardon? 
you heard what I said. Excuse me, because you know he, he this this gentleman answered me a question, and then he forcing me to. Just wanted a yes or no. If there was a bumper on the front of the truck. Well, it depends what you call it, a bumper. It depends what you call. It. As I mentioned, there is by the uh, Fred Liner. There is they built it up by the way it is. Okay, from very front. If you make a point to where you end, you make a point and measure it, it is 25.9 or 25.10. So is based a bumper or not? Yeah, but the bumper is part of the, but rear does not have bumper. But front does. From front of bumper to end of rear, if, as I mentioned, if we make a point if you make a point, it's 25.9. And the reason truck does not can be because truck does have contract and we have, okay, if I bring the truck here, if I bring the truck here, which if you want to, if the commission, honorable commission want to, I'm going to bring the truck. M but Mr. Ampe, Mr. Ampe, I, I think we've heard enough. I mean, we have heard um, some statements from Mr. Dunn on sure. his experience. Sure in dealing with these types of trucks and that that his company has consistently determined that these tractor trailer trucks are greater than 26 feet. Now, it may be that your vehicle is two inches shorter. We don't know. Uh, you've had opportunity to present to Mr. Fields and our inspector, Mr. Morris, your truck so that, that the TLC can measure it. Um, for whatever reason, your truck hasn't been available. Uh, we've made a couple of appointments to do that, and we haven't been able to do that. So we're here now. Um, we've heard everything. We're we we don't need to hear anything else. I don't believe. So well, we just one more one more thing. What case. about they don't accept my credit card? I'm sorry. Why, what about they don't accept my credit card? Well, I, I think we heard from Mr. Dunn that you told them that you were going to immediately Sir, challenge the charge. Is that correct? What about well, you guys? Listen, to that I have it's, it, this is con recorded. You know what I'm saying? And do not take my word. Do not take Mr. Dunn's word. Let's. What was the conversation? Let's listen to that. Well, do you dispute that? Yes, you definitely. You told Mr. Dunn that you were going to immediately challenge the credit card charge. I, absolutely false. That's absolutely false. I never said that. Even I said, I. You, please listen to this conversation. And how, how do we know, to Mr. Dunn's point, that this has not been altered at all? Right. It, 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 I, I believe everything that started this, the, the running through this place and wanting to see files and just say, telling every, all our employees, I will own this place, you have violated my consumer rights, wanting to talk to all that I'm sure has been omitted. And I'm, and, we have no reason not to take a credit card. We take thousands of dollars of credit cards a month. If someone tells us the credit card's gonna be good, you wouldn't take a credit card. If that's the only reason we wouldn't take a credit card. Mr. Dons, do you have camera camera in your yes, sir, office, I do. right? I okay. Do have camera. What about if we uh, let's make another meeting? Yeah, I think we we've, we've heard enough and we're ready to make Well, a but you know, you guys are not gonna wanna hear that that I never said that I'm gonna owing the business, you know, because what I have to do with this. It's just not relevant to but, And what about the credit card? You know, they, they just want to force me to uh, hold the truck again, you know what I'm saying? They, they didn't take my credit card because their credit card was down. You know what I'm saying? And I will appreciate it if you watch it, you know, by yourself and do not believe me, do not believe him, you know, just see what is going on, you know? Or if they said I can't, I did that or I said that, they can, they had camera, we can do not make the decision in this case, and they can bring their proof, and then, I really appreciate it if you listen to this conversation, to, to this recording. You ready for a motion? Is there anyone that wants to, want to view the uh, video recording of, regarding the credit card issue? Mr. Abney, I think we've we've heard enough. I really appreciate you sure. presenting your case, and uh, we're ready to make a ruling. Um, I move based on the information that uh, was presented that there's um, 
no basis for finding a difference in the amount that was charged and the amount that was paid and uh, a subsequent refund uh, given the the difference between the 120 and the one and the, the sixty dollar refund I, I find there's no evidence to to um, uh, to make a ruling in this case anything beyond what's already been accomplished that's rambling but I find no violation is that so your motion is your final violation I move there no violations Carried. All those in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Said one, aye. Abstention. one abstention, three ayes and one abstention. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, folks, for your time. Mr. Abdi, you do have uh, a right to appeal to the Chancery Court if you're unsatisfied. Okay. Next, we have a, another consumer complaint. Let me get my uh, agenda back in front of me. It's regarding a, a booting complaint from Gary Baker. There are actually a total of three complaints. Uh, Ms., uh, Mr. Baker, uh, Mr. Dabrowski, uh, I think. And but uh, and Miss Warren, Miss Warren is in Texas. It could not be present. A different Miss Warren. Another Miss Warren. So, Mr. Baker, I, I see from your complaint you parked in a uh, in an area where, you, and your position is, is it was not sufficiently marked for you to so know to no pay. There was no signage at all the way I come in. And, uh, it was only handicapped spots in the rear of the store, so we thought that was, you know, part of the restaurant uh, or their parking. Uh, the signage or the kioshes way up the hill and there's no signs at all on the handicapped parking signs that says it was a and it said between two dumpsters so I mean it didn't even look like it was part of a you know any kind of pay light and you have a, a handicap license plate uh, yes sir. or a handicap placard my wife yeah. has all right thank you sir Kevin Dorowski. Go ahead. So the handicapped spots are part of the paid lot? No, no, no. I'm. Oh, you're you're I'm making separate. Yeah. Okay. Separate. Are you with the booting company? Yes, sir. I am. Are the handicapped spots part of the uh, paid, paid lot? lot? Yes, sir. They are. They're Is that signage clear? I believe so. I, I brought photographs of the the nearest sign and from the way he explained that he entered the lot and from his where he parked his car. If y'all like to take a look okay. at him. Is this the lot behind? It the lot pepper. belongs to Fannie Battle at Home for At Risk Kids. It'll, let me help them put it in context because they may know the restaurant better. It's Rose Pepper on yes. Eastland Avenue. They, so I know, just so they know where it is. And it's. It appears to have entered through between the building of Rose Pepper and the coffee shop, the apartments that are, the condos that are directly next. There's an alleyway. Mm -hmm. of, okay. Of okay. So not from that. Eastland Cafe yeah. side, but the coffee shop side. Do, it, it's a T-shirt, but there's an alley in the back. And do you have pictures of the Yes, signage. I do. I got a, an aerial photo of the, the parking area. Um, this would be the Rose Pepper and their parking. This is Fanny Battle with the main entrances that are on this block and this mm -hmm. block. And now he came down this alleyway here. This is off of Google Earth, so it's old. He parked right here next to the dumpster. This is from a vehicle entering that 
this alleyway right here, and that's the, the nearest booting sign on the illuminated kiosk pavement. Where is this sign on this map? It's right here where the X is. There's the dumpster that he referred to. There's the handicap space. This is my and car. This is Rose Pepper. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. This is my car parked where his car was parked and a photo of the handicap or of our yes. pay kiosk with the booting sign on it from where he was parked. Taken at night. Taken at night, yes. I have daytime ones too, but I went back and took it at night because he said he was there for dinner. It would be difficult for us to, this isn't, this isn't Fannie Babble's property here. So if we put a sign, it would have to go dead in the middle of the parking lot there and it'd get run over immediately. But there was our argument, or our thought that that was sufficient as to where the sign, you know, you had to drive right past it and then turn around and walk back past it to get back. So are these lots Fannie Babble's? Yes, it's, it's all. It's, all. it's, okay. it's alleyway here and right. an alleyway here and everything to this side of the alleyway is Fannie. To Fannie Battle. And are those spaces marked? Uh, yes, they're all marked and numbered. And there's, like I said, there's signs at each entrance. There's signs all along this row and this row here. They're, they're all over the place. I know I've paid that kiosk before, but it's been Is the handicapped space numbered, too? I'm sorry? Is the handicapped space numbered? No. No, they're not numbered. But the, the, the payment isn't, <coughs> it's not a pay by number. It's okay. pay by license. license. Okay. Yeah, Can I see the that. two loose pictures? Oh, yes, sir. Thank you. There's no sign at all on the sign that says handicapped. And the two signs that he's talking about at nighttime are not lit up. So we come straight down the alley, and there was nothing, you know, that I could see. It was on a January night, like 17 degrees. So I didn't scan everything. We just seen the handicapped signs. If there had been a, any kind of signage around the handicapped signs, that was a pay lot, then I wouldn't have had any problem with it. But there wasn't, and I've never parked back there before. Have you had an issue uh, with people parking in the handicapped spot and not realizing that it's paid? This is our first. Did you want to see the video? I could see that. I mean, I, I took a video. Wow. I'd like to look at it this course. morning or this afternoon. Coming in the alley that I came through. This is coming down Porter Road. This is where I come. I live within a mile of this place. Right? I, we don't eat there very much, but the, all the on-stream parking was blocked, so they said go around back, and when I was going down the alley, which is coming up right here, there's no signage at all that you can see, especially at night when it's 15 degrees. Well, I'm going to go right around through here, and uh, you can see the side of the, uh, the restaurant. That's the restaurant. This is where we're turning in today. And if you look down the driveway, there's nothing there. We're going in the handicaps at the end. And I mean, like I said, there's no other handicap parking at the restaurant. So I just took it for granted that that's where it was. And, and if you look, there is the parking spot. And there's dumpsters on each side, nothing to let anybody know. And I'm a reasonable person. If I've seen a kiosk and, and it's a, you know, mostly residential area. That's where I pulled it in okay. hard. Yes, ma'am. Did you say, um, forgive me. Thank you. Did you say that $95 for two hours parking, I think, is, and that was booted the first no, time I'd so ever been in that lot? I mean, that you get booted the first time now? Like an extra $50? Okay. At this entrance here. I thought it the had to be at least twice or three, three times, I thought. Was a way to enter, but I was booted the very first time I've ever been involved in a parking situation with this company. The, All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Parker. Yeah. Or excuse me, Baker. <laughs> they do it all the time. But it's not well marked at all. But not these. No, that's that is belongs to the restaurant. Okay. No, take care of it. Would be putting a sign there at those handicapped. That is part of a handy uh, pay lot. Like you said, there's it's gravel. There's nothing on the ground, and I just. Didn't look back and forth of each direction. All right, well, thank you very much uh, to both of you for presenting each uh, perspective. Commissioners, is, does anyone would anyone like to make a ruling or a motion? Uh, Mr. Field, a question. Sure. Uh, what, what are the regulations on booting at this point? So the, the way the ordinance reads is that ingress, all ingresses have to have 
a sign that is 24 inches by 18 inches that says that basically he's got two of them and there's just not one on the alley. This is one of the, we've talked, of, yeah. it's been an ongoing issue of what is the ingress into the parking lot. In other words, if ingress means any way you can get in the parking lot, it, it, it is a challenge because there are some of the parking lots that are that you can't mark. In this particular case, it's not on his property that, that he manages, but you can get to this parking, you can get to that parking space through that and it's like not I said, marked. Yeah, exactly. It you can come it. down that alleyway and I can understand where he might not see that right to his left there, you know, if you're just looking straight ahead. Um, you know, without us putting a sign right in the middle of the parking lot that would just get run over. And we um, boot, boot on the first offense? Yes. The, or the Metro Council, it was used to be on the third. Right. Metro Council reduced it to first offense. We didn't reduce We did not. That was Metro Council action. And the other signs are at each of these entrances, is that right? And then here. Yeah. And then that's the actual kiosk. Okay. One is yes. close, the, the one to the <coughs> Porter Road side is close to the entrance of that of the back. The other one is closer toward the middle of the properties is coming off of Scott. I know the street's too low. Yeah. <laughs> Fish wise too, sorry. I would mention it's National Margarita Day since so we've brought up. Oh, that's right, it yeah. is. <laughs> it is. <laughs> there was not a paid advertisement. <laughs> <laughs> what did your representative say? I mean, what's his thought on it? The, the one that was checking it out. Oh, our inspector's here. He's been able to go out and review the lot as well. If you'd like to hear from him. Would anybody like to make a motion? Just so that we're clear, are we are we trying to vote on refunding the the payment that was made? I think what I think what your authority is is you could determine there was a violation, there was a non-compliance of the ordinance. In order to refund, that would probably take a different sort of different actions. The ordinance doesn't speak directly to. If it's y'all's recommendation, we're happy to make the refund if if, if our signage is not adequate and do what we can to make it adequate. And, and one of the things we are working on, for just so everybody's on the same, we are working on a legislative fix right now to bring to you to show, to try to make sure these kind of things are a little better. Again, we have multiple lots that I could take you to that I'm not, on this particular case, you could put a sign with permission of Rose Pepper. You'd actually have to put it on Rose Pepper property, which is property that he is, doesn't manage. So that's the way, that would be a fix to this, but it would require them to do that. There are other places that I'm not sure you could actually get enough signs up to because of the lots are, un, are broken lots where you could actually drive from lot to lot. So it's a we're, we are looking for a legislative fix. According to the agent that went out there, they are currently following the pro protocol as far as the signage that is there. Is that right? Did I ask that right? There is there is still not a, a sign at the entrance of Rose Pepper, really? at the alley by Rose Pepper. How about you read the ordinance? I can do that. So <laughs> I can make it clear. It just, um, so it's clear what you're, what you're trying to figure out. This is what the ordinance says, 6.81.180, signage unpaid parking violations. No boot shall be placed on a vehicle parked at a commercial parking lot unless a permanently affixed sign measuring not less than 24 inches in height and 18 inches in width in all is placed, I'm sorry, in width is placed at all points of vehicular ingress to the lot, which signs shall include the following information in red letter, lettering on a white background. Parking policy strictly enforced, violators will be booted or towed at owner's expense, $50 maximum booting fee, and then the name and the 24-hour number of the booting or towing company has to be affixed. So the question really comes down to what would you consider egress? Correct. And that is not a term that's, that, that's a hard term to, to qualify when you're, when you're faced with a parking lot that looks like this, because there's always going to be a way to go around the sign. Certainly, it sounds like people 
uh, who go to Rose Pepper probably enter that lot from that direction often. And given though that the property is on the other side of the alley, the battle property right. on the other side of the alley. Well, I think because it's on the other side of the alley, I would find that there is, in my mind, that, that battle and parking enforcement are well, in compliance with the existing regu regulations. Mm -hmm. The alley's not well marked either. I mean, you can't tell there's an alley going through there. If you look, it looks just like part of the park. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing about that that's marked off. It needs to be, if you're going to charge people, it ought to be paved, nice looking. And you know, I mean, I'm not going to take a risk on getting a $95 parking yeah. ticket for a $20 dinner. I mean, that's ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, if I knew it, I'd have never parked there, which is my whole thing. I brought that up to the the girl with the boot. I said, why don't you have a sign here on the handicap signs that says, you know, pay lot. I don't, there's nothing there. I mean, you're just, you're going straight down the alley right into that handicap parking spot, I mean, which is 10 feet across. I mean, it's not like it's a, a huge area to get across to get to that line. I do have one question about the fee. So the fine's supposed to be 50, and it may say on here, and I've just missed it, but how did it jump to 95? Actually, the booting removal fee is fifty dollars. We have no authority over the, any fee they would charge for parking. Oh, that's the actual that's parking the without paying. Ticket. Premier okay. parking issues them a violation, and we collect their violation. Okay. All right. Well, I'm I mean, sure it, it does here. appear to me that there's, despite that, the, the uh, just the nature of this, how this lot is configured, that there is no signage appropriate from anyone leaving the rose pepper property and entering this alleyway with these other spaces um, and the fix for the parking or for the booting company would and for the parking lot would be to affix signage on all of these areas in the middle these parking areas well they'd have to do it at the ingress point which would be out next to the alley which belongs to Rose Pepper, is that right? Yeah. Well, the alley well it's either the, the alleyway, but I guess it's technically public property. Well, we could, the, you actually would enter his parking lot at the point one alley bisects the other <coughs> alley. Yeah. So if you were to put a sign at that point, in other words, if you were to go straight from, from uh, Eastland Avenue through the alley between, and then put a sign directly there, that would, and we have to do this all the time. We're parsing, but this would it would be the closest point of ingress from that road, correct? In other words, you go straight from the alley across the alley. There's the ingress stops there. Then there's the alley, and then there's the parking. So that would actually fix it for the future. It wouldn't fix it for today, but it would fix it for the future. If we say if the commissioner says it is, that would be your interpretation. We can fix it at that. We can fix. That's what we can do as a sign fix. Mr. McCready, does that make sense? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Can I make a motion and then follow it with the recommendation? <laughs> Not the recommendation to you, but oh. to these guys. <laughs> uh, I've always bowed to the commission. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I move that, um, I, I, that the commission finds no um, direct violation of the uh, regulations of the Transportation Licensing Commission in this matter. Are you following that with your recommendation or are you waiting? I'm gonna, no, we get, we get, I'm going <laughs> to recommendations for these guys at the end. That's, that's, that's the motion. It's in, as it's written and as it's signed, there's no direct violation of the rules and regulations. And that is because you don't consider this an separate ingress. alley. It's separate alley. Um, I think mm -hmm. the alley bisects a variety of properties, and the the, the parking nice. is on a different side of the alley than Rose Pepper. And you know, because of that, pictures, I think it's the, not the pay, a, the pay kiosk with the booting sign is visible from that alley. It's not directly in the alleyway, but it's a it's a few feet to the left, and it is illuminated at night. 
you'd see people in line there paying the machine last night. I'd still like to hear from the inspector. I mean, he, he told me he I had a, a good case and I hadn't heard anything from him. And there was no signage at all. I mean, how can I be at fault or something? I don't know what's going on. I mean, there's... Well, it doesn't look like you're getting here. A I was second because I agree with Mr. Turner. I, I've been in that, and the only way to get on Fanny Battle's property directly are Chapel and Scott, isn't that right? That's right. the other side. And, um, you know, that's obviously Rose Peppers. So, you know, based on the ordinance you read, the way I'm understanding it is they have met those obligations of when you come in onto their property, that signage is there. Yeah, I can also see where you might get confused, but I have parked in those spots, and I remember the first time I went, I noticed that kiosk right away because <laughs> I was like, hey, <laughs> did this happen? But I went and paid, but that being said, everybody observes things differently. So, um, but I think they have currently met what the ordinance says, but I will second his motion. And then All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Now do I get to make Yes, you get to make a recommendation. Yes. So I want to thank you guys for discussing this in uh, with great civility. Parking enforcement. No yeah, parking enforcement's a good operator. They've offered to make a refund. I think you should accept the refund. Go to Rose Pepper Cantina <laughs> with your wife, and both be happy that you're going to help Mr. Fields and crew improve the regulations going forward for the next folks. Uh, I didn't hear anything about it for <laughs> refund. I, I, I heard it. I, I, I said if you guys suggested it, that we were happy to do it. I just think it's a good thing. You go to Rose Pepper with your wife again, maybe even park in that spot and pay. Well, I'll, I'll, park it, I'll pay for it now that I know it's a parking spot. I'll pay it a lot. Like I said, there's no signage. At all. It was a civil discussion. So and it was appreciate it. To I appreciate that, too. About nine degrees that night, so I wouldn't spend a lot of time looking around. Go in the springtime, which is warm. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Just as a preview, um, the intended language we will we'll have for you guys. Um, I was going to, my idea not to belabor so we can move on is to call it the intended egress or in, rather than, and, and I didn't know if that would help you, but it really didn't have any relevance to this conversation. But then we would really need to look into the intent on how you should enter the property because anyone can bypass uh, or find a bypass. On an alley. Yeah. Right. You can clear the lot of lots like that. Yes. Drive over yeah. the curb. So I drove over the curb. I didn't come in this entrance. Correct. And, you know. it, it is one of the more challenging parts of that, that we work to try to understand. There's a, a second complaint. Uh, Mr. McCready, just stay where you are. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, Ms., Mr. Nebraska. Sir. Yes. All right, so this one is uh, involving another booting incident in which you went to the actual pay machine but then saw that it, there was an option for TGB Correct. and thought that that meant you could just park there and that they would give you some type of validation? Correct. Did you later learn that that was some special rate? I, I did, upon checking out, yes. And then you also say that the boot notice was not affixed to your window with, the, with adhesive? Correct. insufficient signage at the entrance of the lot with the sign less than 42 inches from the ground? Correct. Who's, who said we don't care, we'll do whatever we want? 
I don't have the name that was uh, the supervisor on duty for parking LLC on uh, I believe the Monday after the ticket I got I got the ticket uh, it was Friday night anything else uh, no I mean I think it sort of spurs off that last case that we just talked about um, it was a <coughs> misunderstanding that I didn't pay for parking had I realized that the TGB when I was eating at tailgate brewery uh, was not a validated code uh, I would have just paid for it at the time um, afterwards I noticed the signage uh, did not well so at, at first when I looked at the Metro code 6.81 the first thing that came up uh, had referenced the booting um, where there was uh, required of three offenses before that uh, that was a Nashville.gov site that I found that on. However, I, I subsequently learned that that had been changed. So I'm not disputing that, although I'm frustrated with that. You know, first time ticket, never having an offense before, it would be $95 um, to get out of it. But the real thing that I wanted to sort of reference was uh, in follow up to what uh, Mr. Fields had listed last time, he read uh, 6. Point, I think 180 part A. Part B uh, was not read, and if you would like to sort of read that for the books, and I have. Oh, sorry, I could. Sure. It, uh, the second part says, "Signs shall not." I'm sorry. Such signs shall not be less than 42, and not more than 72 inches from the ground. So it has to be at least 42 inches above the ground, and no higher than 72. Again, we did ask the inspector to go and look at the signs. He's present. If you'd like to hear from him. No, they w it wasn't high enough up off the ground. When he called us and told us about it, I, I have the picture of the sign after we fixed it. Before the blue and the red were switched, the red was on the bottom, the blue was on the top. And uh, I, that's the picture I sent to Inspector Morris after we right. after fixed it, it after he called us. If I may, this looks two or three days after, um, after I got the ticket. That's how it looks. So there's that and that. Subsequently, just on my lunch break today, driving over here, I drove past numerous premier parking uh, parking lots. So this is a picture of the premier parking lot closest to the parking lot I was ticketed in, separate parking lot, but uh, and again, area of egress that doesn't have the appropriate signage on it, or ingress, sorry. I mean, clearly there's a, a, an arrow that's saying that that's an area of ingress. It's not an alley, it's not questionable. This is one sign, uh, again, so the dark marks right there, it's one foot, two foot, three foot, so it should be minimum 40, 42, so uh, what is that, three and three and a half foot, you know, so somewhere in there. Um, sorry, here's another different, uh, or sorry, that was the, the sign today um, of the parking lot that I got the ticket in, so after the change. This was a different sign and a different parking lot, also Premier, also the same thing. Another different sign, different parking lot, Premier of Another sign, rear parking lot, separate one. Yeah. So I get this point. This was literally driving from Germantown uh, to the area uh, of, of where I got the ticket today. And there was at least 12 different notifications that I got of signs there. The, the best sign is actually, if I may, this one here, where it is less than two feet off the ground. One, one foot, ten inches off the ground. It's for so. small cars. We, we yes. don't move in all premier lots, even though they put our sign on all their lots. It doesn't necessarily mean to be They put it up as a deterrent. I was going to ask that question. Now, Mr. McCree, do you put up some of the signs, or does Premier do premier all? Premier puts up their own signs. Okay. And then if, 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 I, if there's an issue, I can call them and ask them to change okay. it. Okay. I didn't know how that worked. You know, if, if it's a lot, they request that we move in, or the owner of the lot requests that we move in. Obviously, then they need to get it within compliance. But there's the majority of their lots we don't move at all. Mr. McCready, is there anything you'd like to add or, or respond to? Uh, the, 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 there's a number of things in the written complaint that, that weren't true. We spoke on the phone. I did never, never said in any way, shape, or form that I would do what I want, and I didn't care. I've never said that to anybody. Um, the where he said that the immobilization notice was on the ground, he told me 
verbatim, word for word, that the immobilization notice, however, that it, there was no adhesive, but it was wedged into his window. Now, we use the minimal amount of adhesive because after years of doing this, people get more angry about putting a sticker on their car than they do about a boot on their car. So we fold a piece of scotch tape in half and put it on the back of it and wedge it in the window. If I may address that, this is the notification that I got. It was found on the ground. That's not what you told me. You can see it clearly here where the only markings on this, there's no adhesive at all. The only markings are where it was shoved into the uh, door frame. And it was a windy, cold night, and this was on the ground. I only happened to notice that I had a boot. I came to the front of the car. I was with uh, my wife, my three-and-a-half-week-old baby at the time, and another friend. Uh, I came to the front of the car. The only reason why I knew I had a ticket was the ticket was on the windshield. Uh, I didn't realize my car was booted because I didn't see this until somebody walking around the back when the passengers got in said, oh, you got a boot on your car. So. And that, and the windy night was still laying right there on the ground next to it? It was. Oh, okay. Yeah. You, 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 you know that's not what you told me? That's exactly what I told you. No, it's not. Here's this, I can't quite see it. The other thing, and I'm not having even brought up, also in the metric code, it lists that that should be a minimum of five by seven, and it's closer to four and a half by just just slight of seven. So. Everybody take measure for Christmas. We submit that with our application every year, and they've never had an issue with it for 10 years running. Any other questions by the commission? Out of curiosity, what is TGB? It's, it's a, a bar, it's called Tailgate Brewery. And the premier offers them like a, I believe it's a free hour or something for them to go in and out. And they, when you select that option on their machine, it asks for a coupon code. Okay. Correct. And that's what I had misunderstood as a validation code. And. Uh, it's true, it's a bar, but it, it's a it's a pizza place. Right. So we went there for dinner. I was not going to have drinks. And similar to Mr. Baker, I had a, a $30 Groupon that was good for two pizzas. So that's why we went there. So a, a $95 parking fee for a $30 dinner. Seems like but, but you have to have coupon code to use that Correct. parking. To, to use, yeah, that option is the Premier, is it some deal that Premier has worked out with the, the brewery there, with TGB, Tuggy Brewery, restaurant. But you still have to print out the ticket. Even yeah, yeah, anybody who parks there has to pay for parking. That, that option, the only people that know the coupon code are the, I guess, their staff. Oh. <coughs> yeah. So when I, when I had asked them about the validation, as we were settling our bill, that's when he said that validation is only for their managers. So at that point, I went out and it was too late. I was already ticketed and booted. Mm -hmm. So the, way the, the inspector did find a violation with the signs. Cool. Inspector Morris. Yes. And do we have the signs for when, when you went to this particular lot, what did you, as you were inspect, what did you find? Uh, excuse me, found that, that the uh, sign was too low. I think if I remember right, it's like 25 inches above. Uh, there was also a temporary sign uh, that was actually sitting there that was blocking the other sign also. Uh, so there was actually a couple of complaints that I was working in regards to the same thing. Uh, so I did notify the parking that uh, the sign was illegal and that the, part of the temporary sign was illegal because it was blocked in. And for us, that's an illegal lock. The temporary sign had, in the future, been stationed down on the roundabout to direct people up 17 for parking. Somebody moved it up and put it in front of the sign. When he notified me, immediately moved it back where it belonged, where it had always been. Before. Is that lot now compliant? Did you raise that sign? I did raise the sign and I provided a picture. Last point, the temporary parking sign, this picture is dated today, 12.32 p.m., and that temporary park here sign yeah. is right back the place of where it is. The only difference is that the red uh, towing notice has been raised up above. That temporary parking sign is that one. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is that the temporary parking sign that you're talking about? Yes. Parking. Yeah.
again, one of, the, one of the great challenges we have, we have regulatory authority over the company. The parking lot, we have relatively no authority, so it, it's really a challenging time. But I was, yeah, I'm sorry. Saying correct. Those they, correct. And but but you did find that the sign the sign has been corrected now. Yes, sir. This one. Has, right? This one. Okay. But it was not there. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Is there a motion regarding? Um, is it Mr. Mr. Ab or Mr. Dab? Dabrowski. Dabrowski. Yeah. I think my emails. Okay. Yeah, D-A-B, but that's just because most people struggle to spell Dabrowski. Is there a motion regarding uh, Mr. Dabrowski's consumer complaint in regards to any violations of the booting code, excuse me, metro codes regarding uh, booting? size of the notice it doesn't quite meet the five by seven and a violation of the uh, height requirement of the uh, of the signage and that's I believe those are both uh, under 681 681 point. Oh six oh. I'm sorry. I believe we find a, a violation of the uh, requirement to, to uh, that the notice be a minimum of five by seven, um, and the uh, violation of the height of the sign um, was lower than forty two inches required. Two violations. All those in favor. Motion passes. I guess we have to clear up the as, clear as, what we're going to do about yeah. it. Yeah, move as a result of the violation that uh, that parking uh, enforcement LLC refund uh, the fees paid by uh, Mr. Dabrowski. All those in favor? Aye. Motion passes. I think that is that concluded. You can finish with your motions. I think so. I think it's one of the things that would be helpful. And and again, I I, I certainly don't question Mr. McCready's tenacity or his desire to get the signs of the right. If the commissioner would direct him to review all of the lots that he that he is able to boot in, that to make sure all the signs are at the proper height and report back to us certify back to us that all of them are at the 42 to 72. Absolutely. And again, if if the office aided, if, if I aided in that notice, uh, chances are when I looked at it, I would have said it looks like five inches and I did not measure it. So I apologize for that. But it's been that same since I got here in 2012. But I will we'll certainly, I, I'm confident we can correct that issue. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Thank you again, Mr. McCready. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Looks like there's another um, booting complaint. Uh, this complainant is not here. It's from Rebecca and Aaron, Eric Warren. Okay, Ms. Warren, uh, she, I spoke with her yesterday. She had to be in Texas today, and she could not be here. So she recognized without being here she could not pursue the complaint. But if y'all like to take a look at it, I, I brought a list of the transactions the machine ran that night, and she claimed the machine wasn't working. And Premier provided me with the list of all the transactions the machine really, uh, machine that did that night. Um, can you present yeah. the list of transactions? Thank you.
Do you have records of when you actually physically booed the car at the time? Um, it's it's written on the immobilization notice, and then Premier, when they write a ticket, it's digitally time stamped, and they take photographs. Um, this, I don't know when, I don't know where the 1035 on the complaint comes from. I see it right here on the okay. as well. Yeah. It appears 1035 is what time we booted our car. It appears that there were transactions prior to and stuff. And after the second page has a few late night transactions there. All the time, yes, sir. And if it's something, some sort of technical issue, we automatically refund it. If if they weren't just not charged or released on the spot, you know, it's technology it never works like it's supposed to. And so, presumably, when there have been malfunctions, it's been when there's a malfunction, you pull into a lot. You see a number of cars there that aren't paid for most people a lot of people will write a note saying there was an issue you can tell when their machine's been down you go to the machine and see it's down uh, we don't boot cars in a lot where the machine's down where there's any kind of issue Based on the evidence presented of transactions take both prior and subsequent to the time indicated on the complaint, um, that there is no uh, violation of, of Metro Code, no evidence of violation of Metro Code rules and regulations. Yeah, I'll second. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Motion Aye. passes. We also have a complaint against Southern Comfort Carriages uh, that this is going to be deferred to the March meeting. Yes, I would report to you, Mr. Uh, Morris. Uh, Mr. Morrison, the owner of uh, Southern Comfort's daughter, was killed in a fire last week, and he asked that we defer action until next month. It's a very defer. All those in favor? Aye. Motion passes. Aye. Uh, we also have some other business. Um, Michael Winters of Cruising has submitted a request to modify the load speed vehicle ordinance, excuse me, load speed vehicle operations area. Um, this might be ripe for discussion next next month when when we have a broader discussion on changes. When Mr. Winters uh, requested, uh, I'd, I'd, as I try to, is give everybody an opportunity to speak with the commission. Uh, I told him that, that it was certainly coming at an interesting time uh, and that uh, he may, and I think what I say is you may want to make this later, but he, uh, he wanted to address you today. So if you've got a few minutes and then he may, I'm confident he'll want to be heard again. <laughs> what are you trying to say, Billy? <laughs> I got a video for you to watch too. But no. no offense intended to the commissioner, staff, and Mr. Winters, but I have a four o'clock phone call. Totally understand. I understand, based on uh, Mr. Hernandez' math, that we still have a quorum if I leave. Correct, you do have a quorum. <laughs> and I'm assuming that Mr. Winters want to make a presentation, provide additional data that you'd be able to study between now and your hearing next yeah. month. Yeah, but once again, Michael from Cruising, uh, thank you for your time, and I'll make this short. I know you guys have had a long one today. This obviously is something that's probably going to get pushed to the meeting when we look at the traffic studies and that kind of stuff. I just, I guess, timed it perfectly. It wasn't intentional. Um, the purpose of this presentation that I, and, and I've got some stuff I'll give you, and I think you already have some copies, which are probably a bad photo if I remember correctly of what I sent to you. Um, 
we've been doing this for three years now. Uh, we are we are the only company that's uh, regulated by the TLC that has had GPS on all of our vehicles since the first day they've hit the street. We have three years worth of GPS data. I have an extremely well knowledge of where our vehicles go, what they do, how long they sit, how fast they go. We have an amazing amount of data, and Billy can probably attest um, that I send more emails to Billy about our drivers doing stuff wrong uh, than probably anybody else, if, if not everybody combined. Um, so I think we do a really good job of managing our team. I obviously see some issues with the study. I see some conflicts of, of, of stuff there. Um, one of them obviously being they didn't talk to us. They don't know what we do. So it's kind of hard to make recommendations when you've never actually, but that's another story. Um, point being is in the three years that I've done this, all I've seen is the low speed vehicles ask for more and more and more and expand their territories and expand their this and expand their that. What I've seen in three years of monitoring this is we don't need the operating zone we have. It's too big. Um, three other companies that do this agree with me. Um, um, so I think what you'll find, and, and I printed out some better copies, which I will give you real quick, um, is my child's version of the operating zone. You have to get, get my Crayola coloring on there. Um, but in a nutshell, I think we can chop out half the operating zone. Because um, at the end of the day, um, and it varies by company, most of our business is tourist related. We do some stuff with condos and people that live downtown and that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, we service the tourist industry. Um, if you look at my rough notes on the very top, uh, I put add circle A. That's an area that I think we need to add because the riverfront development's coming. You got Top Golf out there. There's a lot more stuff coming there in the very near future, with it, which is all currently industrial. But I think that's a small section that could be should be looked at adding. But if you look at the places that I named B, C, and D, I think they get removed. Um, reason being is, um, uh, first off, this is real deep. entire month you can see the lines where we actually go in vehicles um, as you review this stuff later on what you will find is our vehicles uh, very seldom ever go into what I call category B um, and if we do we're making I can think of one guy that works five or six days a week and if he makes five runs to East Nashville a year that's probably a lot um, we just don't go that far that much um, and from the traffic study, what you will find is it's, it's, a, it's a long trek out there. It's a long trek back. There's lots of cars along the way. I don't see a reason to open that up to the low speed vehicles. I don't think there's a necessity at this time. Um, so for once, the low speed vehicle uh, is trying to give something back. And I, I, I just don't think we need that spot. If you look at section D, which I have a little circle D on, that is 12 South. The problem with that is, once again, it's a long drive all the way down there, and to be very candid, that territory doesn't even go into really 12 South. You're about three blocks short, so you really don't serve the purpose of going down there anyway, so why have the extended route? And if you look at the section I labeled C, there's just no reason for us to really go over there with the exceptional person that happens to live there or what have you. There's no tourist area over there um, that we're spending time at. Um, I'm more than willing to provide any GPS data that you guys want to review when it comes to real data, what we do, where we go. Uh, the reality is from the river to the gulch to Marathon Village is 90% of our time. We do some tours that circle by the Parthenon, but most of our, our, most of our stuff is in that concentrated area. Uh, I think we can downsize the operating zone, uh, which will make it easier to manage from my perspective as well as Billy's. Uh, I think some of the issues you're going to find with the traffic study is all the recommendations are great and dandy, but who's going to enforce all these rules? You know, the street you can drive on every other Tuesday and only when it's sunny. That takes a lot of people to figure out in the low speed vehicle world. Uh, and, and, and a recommendation, and you guys can do what you want with this, I think you might want to separate uh, the low speed vehicles away from the other vehicles because our zone is bigger, because we do go faster. I think looking at the pedal taverns and all that stuff at one time. Um, it's it probably not fair to everybody involved because the slower vehicles that are entertainment purposes only are different than the vehicles that are transportation and entertainment. Uh, just side note, but um, questions. I'll try to keep it short. Sorry. Because we do tours out there, we, we offer a 30 minute, a one hour, and an hour and a half tour. Our hour and a half tour does go through the Parthenon. We've constructed routes that go there without getting on the main drags that are restricted. Um, most of our tours are 30 minutes to an hour, but we I just booked one the other day. It's 16 people that are doing an hour and a half tour, and we will put them on three carts and go all the way through the Parthenon, Marathon Village, what have you. Um, and in relation to that, one of the recommendations was to alleviate tours, and very candidly, if you take tours out of low-speed vehicles, the low-speed vehicles are gone.
that's where we predominantly make most of our revenue and very candidly we get a lot of requests to do it if we became point to point only uh, we would find a way to buy a bunch of 40-foot buses and get out of the uh, low-speed vehicle world <laughs> be very honest and then you said Mr. Winters is very candid with us. <laughs> <laughs> You did say Marathon Village. I'm trying to. We do a lot at Marathon. At there I mean, there's, a, there's a lot of people like going over there, and there's lots of routes to get there without going down Charlotte and that kind of stuff. Right. It's, it's an easy place to get to and, and take roads that really most people don't take. So C is mostly residential? Um, we just don't have a demand. The, the biggest residential demand we have is Germantown, the Gulch. I, I'll hate to say it, the, the hotter residential areas. Same reason in East Nashville. We don't have a lot of demand out in East Nashville to go that direction for residential. Most of the residential stuff we do is in the hotter areas of Nashville, Germantown, the Gulch, what have you. Now, will that change over time? I'm sure it will. I drove by what I call Section A today, and they're building all kinds of stuff out there. So that residential piece is going to start picking up. Um, my biggest reason for putting that in there is Top Golf is over there in the riverfront. If they do it in 2020, it's going to be monstrous, and there's going to be a lot of draw that direction. Why do you think that? with this change in the zone, which what it appears to me, Mr. Winters, is all you're doing is getting rid of the areas that you don't have a lot of traffic anyway, correct? Big part of it, yes. So wh why is it that you believe that you sh could be able to operate safely from four to six? Well, number one, in the three years we've done this, and, and Billy can correct me if I'm wrong, there's not one uh, safety episode of any kind with a low-speed vehicle that's ever occurred, with the exception of, I think, one of the joyride carts pulled into a parking lot a little too fast, and they had an issue, and very candidly, that was gross driver negligence. Um, but other than that, I don't know of any issues of any kind with the low-speed vehicles. Um, so you can correct me if I'm wrong, Billy. But it, it was prior to regulation. Yeah. Prior to regulation. But I think it wasn't part of the problem, though. It wasn't just safety. It was... It was a driver problem. Well, but I mean, it was also there's law, traffic. There's a lawsuit. That, and I think I think what he's saying. One of the things that's come back to us is that because they're able to to move within three miles of the speed of the traffic movement, mm -hmm. is that they're not actually they shouldn't be considered in the same category as a pedal carriage, a pedicab, or a horse and carriage because of the difference that even our consultant had expected had said. So that actually during especially the four to six time period they're really not hindering traffic because they're moving within in close proximity to what the speed is already i'm not defending that i'm just trying to interpret <laughs> yeah. mr weather i would agree i would like to see the four to six opened up to 21st i don't want to go down deep west end i don't want to go deep in those areas because that's not where the, the most of the hotels and stuff that we service that four to six areas and i'm sure you'll hear this from other people we get bombarded with phone calls from hotels people want to go to dinner they want to do stuff prior to their evening so that four to six restriction obviously does hurt uh, i think we could pull that off between i'll call it the river and 21st safely as we've done for three years and i don't think we're impeding traffic in any way because we're flowing with the slow traffic that's already there and the study even showed slow moving vehicles only make up 1.3 percent of the total traffic they studied so the other 97 percent is flowing along with us but we're 1.3 of the in theory the traffic problem to answer i guess your question to some extent there um, and speaking of the four to six we are allowed to be on the road between four and six uh, we can't have passengers correct I, I so just a that. traffic study clarification but that's what you're seeing is you're seeing drivers move on and off the road between that four and six time frame but and certainly something that you could discuss at, at an open and a public hearing that we are going to schedule for next month yeah I made all kinds of notes for the public hearing, so I'll try to refrain myself. <laughs> <laughs> all right. You're well, like, thank you I'm very ready. much, Mr. Winters. <laughs> thank you for your time. You'll be back next month. <laughs> and if you guys, you know, have data that you'd like to see on GPS data, that kind of stuff, like I said, we've got a, a plethora of it. So we can give you real-time data of where we are, at what times, and all that kind of fun stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone would like to make a motion to adjourn? Do we have other business? One, one announcement that needs to be made. We have had an application for a transfer of an emergency record zone. Uh, Roadmaster Incorporated that does business as Tow Pro and as Cotton's Towing uh, would like to, uh, they're, they, would, they're in the, they would like to purchase AB Collier record and, and then operate the zone that AB that's currently assigned to that company. They made the application. It has to be 
if you approve it, it has to be done in a public hearing, and anyone else can also apply to operate that zone. Not to buy the company, obviously, that's an agreement between the companies, that, that's, that's a separate agreement, but the assignment of a zone can only be made by the Transportation Licensing Commission, and it can only be done at a hearing, at a public hearing, where everyone has an opportunity to speak. All right. I would recommend we do that also in the month of March. Um, okay. Thank that you. was my business. I move we adjourn. Do we have to officially do that? Yes. <laughs> I make a motion to adjourn. Second. All Second. those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passed. Aye. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.